Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands, dust off your broomsticks, and join us as we unlock the treasures behind Chamber of Secrets, Chapter 14, Cornelius Fudge. The worst. The worst. The worst. Well, actually, I don't even know if in this chapter he is the worst, but I also don't think he deserves to have this chapter named after him. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's necessary necessarily named after him he's not like like um book five the worst in the way that he will eventually become but he's the, there's like shades of it there's shades of it for yeah. sure for sure i mean it's it's like i i th- there's there's probably like commentary to be made about the the level of reaction re the opening of the chamber of secrets Um, inside of this chapter that I think is disproportionate based on everything else that has happened the rest of the year. Yes. Um, It's it's very much like, it's kind of like, you know, there are people actively being attacked in the school. There is unknown, like, like hate text being painted on the walls, presumably in blood. And basically the school is just sort of like, yeah, well, it's happening. Like, yeah. But you know what? These things happen, right? You know, it's like you, you almost have to get the feeling that like petrification is just is like not like in the wizarding world. It's just sort of like someone got petrified. God, that's a bummer. But like, yeah, I mean, obviously, we'll just sort of undo it. Yeah, right. Kind right, of thing. Yeah. Like, like it must not be registering. I guess people don't even know, though, that well. Like they're sort of hushing it up. But the other thing is that apparently it's happened before. And it's like this is this is the like, yeah you're right it's like the timing of everything is what seems so weird because like they're like oh it's been four attacks got to be seen to be doing something and it's like why is four the number right like if you think it's the chamber of secrets and this exact pattern happened before and you are like a thousand percent sure you caught the right person last time and that person still works at the school like immediately. You should like you should have gotten Hagrid immediately. Uh, that's you a know? thing. Yes. Yeah. And and so I, I think what I find interesting about this chapter, and we can we can talk about it now or talk about it then. But like you know, the idea here is that it's the chapter is titled Cornelius Fudge because we're being introduced to the Minister for Magic for the first time, where he's showing up yeah. basically to to prove to the wizarding populace that he is on top of the situation. That like right. action is happening it's taking place like not to worry and it's like on on that level i i do feel like from like a politician standpoint there there is like the the need in instances like this where it's like you know you need to show that that there is progress because otherwise people are going to be like y'all what are we doing about the problem and it's like oh we're, we're currently doing nothing um you know so it's like in, in general people want to see there being progress to be made and it's like the question is are the attacks inside of this chapter just the first time that the the greater wizarding populace is being made privy to the situation at all? Yeah, I don't like, know. It's like it's really the phrasing of his sentence got to be seen to be doing something. Oh, right. Yeah, I know. Yeah, like, you're right. It's like yeah. the, the only reason I'm doing it is so that I'll be perceived as handling the problem. He's he's not even like of the mindset like we need to handle this problem, you know? Right, right. It's right. not like Which, we've got to do something because it's like you are doing something. You are doing exactly what you should be doing, presumably. Yes, right. Yes. Like, like, like it's like, not like got to be seen. To be, I'm only arresting Hagrid so that I will be seen as doing something. I'm not arresting Hagrid because I think he did it, which. I still do think, which is the weird thing. Well, that's the question. So it's like, in, in my mind, I almost have to imagine, because I know that uh, going into Order of the Phoenix, it's like we, we'll learn more about like Fudge's relationship with Dumbledore and sort of like, I think maybe his possible, you know, imposter syndrome relative to Dumbledore's brilliance, where it's it seems like for most of his time in office, he's usually written to Dumbledore to get advice from Dumbledore yeah. in terms of like, you know, how should we be going about things? And like, you know, while Dumbledore doesn't want to accept the position himself, you know, he's like happy to like consult in the comings and goings. And so in, inside of this chapter, to me, it definitely reads as though Fudge like does have a deep respect for Dumbledore. Like, yeah. you know, even even like when Lucius Malfoy shows up, it doesn't really come across to me like like 
fudges on Lucius's side. Oh, definitely. I mean, he definitely is sort of like, <laughs> hold on, hold on. I'm doing this for some political points, but if you want to act like, I think we, we definitely should not be removing Dumbledore. We all agree on that, right? Yeah, yeah. It, se yeah. it seems like that's that's basically the spot that he's in. And so in, in my mind, I mean, again, assuming Fudge is always just mostly looking out more for himself than anything else, th there's a piece of me that wonders like whether or not like he knows that by coming here under these circumstances and enacting the plan of the governors of the school, which, you know, this book is really the only book I think we ever, maybe in Prisoner, do we hear a little bit more about the governors? It doesn't matter. They, they make it seem like the governors are going to be like a big deal. Yeah, like and they're then, going to constantly be a thorn in your side. Right, right. Like, or yeah. that we should know any of them at all other than Lucius Malfoy. Right, yeah. Who um, are the other 11 governors? Right, yeah. We, we yeah. never have any idea. We don't know. Um, Seems like they'd be coming to like the Quidditch matches and stuff, you know? Definitely seems like yeah, these are yeah. patrons of the school who are who are like you know uh, like stepping into a board of directors position right. probably due to their prominent roles in other aspects of wizarding society or else because their own children are at the school or that yeah. yes yes indeed um, but so anyway I think you know like the the tight space that I'm imagining fudge being caught between here is basically like being called to perform a particular action because to to your credit it's sort of or to your point real, rather it's like. It's like, why didn't they do this from the start? And in my mind, Fudge probably in the, from the start like wasn't feeling enough pressure from the rest of the world and was like, I don't really want to like rock the boat in my relationship with Dumbledore. So like, right. I, I'm going to not do that, you know? And, and then it's sort of like, okay, well, now my hand is forced and like, the optics are getting really bad. So it's kind of like a Peter Pettigrew kind of situation. I where mean, it's it's, like, I think it is Dumbledore who says it in, maybe, maybe it's in the fourth, movie or something or maybe it's in one of the books but it's something along the lines of like fudge is doing like what is easy not what is right sort of thing sure and it's sort of like that's sort of been the case the whole time because it's like you're at like what's what's easy is not rocking the boat with his relationship with dumbledore despite students being attacked and the suspect of the last occurrence of this 50 years ago still being present at the school right you know it's like Dumbledore uh, couldn't help but notice. I got a report about uh, students being petrified. This happened again right. uh, 50 years ago. Happening now. Got to do something. Sorry about that. Like, right. that's, what, like that's, the, that's the right thing to do immediately. Right. As opposed to the easy thing of just like, well, Dumbledore's got it. If he says it's not a problem, it's not a problem. Right, right, Which right. Is like, and it's like, it, this is such a weird thing to argue because, like, like of course, they're all wrong about Hagrid. <laughs> But yes, like, yes. But like, and as we far know as they're wrong. And we know they're wrong, but they don't know they're wrong, and they think they're right. And if they think they're right, and they aren't, I mean, I mean, again, this is all based on just Tom Riddle's word 50 years ago. But right. as far as they're concerned, they are right. They know it's Hagrid, and so that they're not acting on it is bananas. I, I know. That's the thing. That's like what's so weird about it, though, is that it's almost like it's like Fudge's inaction is almost more. Like, like his proper action is probably something that we, the readers, would be more upset with. Like, if they had come and hauled Hagrid off from the very beginning, we'd be like, no, what the heck? Like, that's even more time he unnecessarily had to spend in Azkaban. Like, it obviously wasn't him. But it's like, again, you know, it's like, it's not obviously not Hagrid. And probably a lot of this stuff should have happened way sooner yeah but but it is it's really hard to be like arguing against Hagrid against Dumbledore in favor of like the ministry action right because we we the readers know that the ministry tends to yeah. not necessarily we have all the information <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah yeah so it's but but you're right yeah so it's like if you change your position inside of the story a little bit it's sort of like maybe maybe this is is the correct the correct yeah. course There's a, yeah a lot of weird decisions in this chapter yes. um well let's just touch on the chapter art real quick I felt like this one was a little more meh then maybe some of the others is basically just the list that Lucius Malfoy brings to uh, cart Dumbledore away, I think. Yeah, I know. I mean, it, it kind of it looks more like it could be the chapter art for like Dumbledore's army. Yeah, it does you know? look more like, like that. Like at the top of the list, it's just the big, very like informally written Roman numeral 12. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> which I assume stands for the 12 governors. Almost certainly. Yeah. That, that, that stands to reason. Yeah, yeah. I think I can follow that logic. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, it's a very like declaration of independence looking long, lengthy, ancient scroll type thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, really all, all of that. I mean, 
th- it's the name of the chapter, but really most of the, the, all like this happens sort of like at the very tail end. Yeah, just sort of right at the end there. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, I guess you want to dive in, and we'll just we'll just kind of like work our way through it. Yeah, we'll ju- we'll work our way through. I'm sure we'll bring up a lot of the same points as we go. But let's see. So we start out, and as a reminder, at the end of the last chapter, Harry flies back out of the diary and realizes that oh my gosh, it was Hagrid who opened the Chamber of Secrets 50 years ago. Yes. And so now they're sort of like they've always known Hagrid's had a liking for um, large, large and monstrous creatures. Monstrous creatures. And then the first thing I highlighted here was just like Harry was sure that Hagrid would have gone to any lengths to have glimpsed it if he thought there was a chamber or if he thought there was a monster like lurking around the castle, which is an interesting like thought because like it's actually not even true um, because like the last time the chamber was opened, like Hagrid wasn't looking for the monster sure sure right. yeah so and, and i think like this is this this whole book really is all about sort of like it's a big who done it i think yeah. is like what's really kind of going on and, yeah. and i think that this chapter takes that like yet to another level but i mean we've talked a lot about like percy being an obvious red herring there's sort of like the little mentions of of Ginny being here there and everywhere there's there, there's like all of like draco's you know slurs and stuff like that that sort of like puts him as like an obvious you know center target there's there's dobby at the very beginning who is coming from someone somewhere which right. i mean probably wouldn't be that that hard to figure out that it could be the malfoys just if you're assuming it's going to be connected to someone we know <laughs> i mean they guess it pretty immediately right right um you know and then like so i don't know if like like every good who done it you've ever watched the way that they usually unfold or, or read as you're going through the story is like y- you basically think like, well, it can't be them. And then someone at some point will like build the case against them. And all of a sudden it starts to look really suspicious. And you're right. Like, now nah, there kind of is, is there kind of is something there. Like he he did make that comment. And, uh, you know, and then so I, I think this chapter is basically like, you know, you would have left on the cliffhanger at last chapter being like, Hagrid, what? No, like the no. gentlest, kindest, friendliest, you know, just looking out for everybody, just just working hard, living in his humble existence, mm-hmm. like Hagrid. It's like, how could it be? How could and, it be? And, and I think that basically to answer that question, it's like, well, lest, lest we forget that he does have a giant three-headed dog that's named Fluffy that was being used basically, you know, in, in a in a parameter where Dumbledore himself like declares you know do not go to the third floor corridor unless you wish to miss uh, to suffer a most painful death yeah you know it's like okay so fluffy a bit dangerous yeah then you know he's he's trading valuable hogwarts information for uh norbert and the dragon egg right um you know he's got fang who i, I mean for all intents and purposes fang seems pretty okay right yeah um but otherwise you know i mean he he's just always he's always sort of like had an affinity for for large creatures and such so like i i suppose maybe like even if what's happening with Hagrid or even if what you're supposed to be believing about Hagrid as like a potential target is something along the lines of like, well, maybe he wasn't malicious in his intent. Right. But maybe his curiosity got the best of him. Right. And then it got out of control. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's like a grand example of like, okay, like there's, there's intent versus impact. You know, it's like, like if you were to assess the the two there, like if Hagrid was the one who had opened the, the chamber of secrets, his intention was not to rid the school of yeah muggleborns it's Muggle just borns. to see the monster it, it's it's raw curiosity yeah you know so intentions are good impact is bad right. myrtle dies on the on the flip side then you've got someone like tom riddle who like wants to open the chamber to rid the school of <laughs> of muggleborns, of muggle-borns. Yeah. you know his his like you know his intentions are bad and the impact is bad yes you know so yes. I, I you know it's it's yeah I don't know. So I, I think basically it doesn't even seem, I mean, the chapter doesn't even get all the way through where you're suspecting Hagrid of being the potential villain. But I suppose there are a couple of other instances that, that maybe like could quietly still not exclude him um, as we go forward. Because one of the other big thing, things that we have happening inside of this chapter is um, Harry's room is being like ransacked. Yeah, yeah, that that is the other big thing that's going to happen in a couple of pages. Yes. Uh here, let's see. Um I guess we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, I guess the other issue with Hagrid is that like even if he did it 50 years ago and he didn't mean to do it, he you can almost rule him out because it's like, but why would he have opened it again? You know, like what what would 
make him reopen it then. R- right. You know. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and and that's like one of those where you know. Um, it's it's like is it a slow game you know i mean like snape is actively quietly keeping a foot in two camps for most of our our saga and everything it's like right. is there a world where it's like okay you know i was going to do it to harry on his first year but then you know i mean it's like any good villain all you have to do is just give them the monologue and explain their story and then all of a sudden it's like oh man that's, oh right that's like wild. if Hagrid was like i was going to befriend you or whatever yeah. yeah it's like i i had won dumbledore's trust and i knew i just had to bide my time right <laughs> I, went, <laughs> I went very leprechaun yeah you did a little bit there yeah, yeah. that's my bad that's my bad um i, I normally go pirate whenever yeah. i try to do hagrid um but yeah i mean you could you could see that being like you entered your first year and you know you trusted me and i kept guiding you towards the the danger right you yeah know, like i mean it's it's like after all when you look at like sorcerer stone philosopher stone like throughout the whole saga like hagrid is the one who keeps slipping information you know yeah. it's like he's he's got like a lot of you know blood on his hands so right speak, yeah for or, sure or yeah like and then he you know he has them deal with Norbert instead of him doing it himself. And right, right. Yeah. And, and it All is that. a beast. That's that's right. the castle. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so we get to the next page here. Hermione says, Riddle might have got the wrong person, which is a very clever way to phrase this sentence, I think, because it makes you like, you agree with Hermione, and it's even true that Riddle, Riddle got the wrong person because, of course, Riddle is the one doing it. Right. But it's like, it's like that like throws... Um, like blame away from Riddle. It's like Riddle might have got the wrong person. It's like yes, you want to believe Hermione. Like that's true. He might have gotten the wrong person. It's like, but like because she phrases it like that, you don't think that it is Riddle. I know. You still know. like it's just that he made a mistake, not that Riddle did it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. And, and yeah. I, I think that that does that does like sort of continue a little bit. Um, she she does have like one of those Ron moments from last week, uh, where it says maybe it was some other monster that was attacking people, and it's like yes. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Dead, dead ringer. Dead that ringer. Is, that is exactly correct. Yeah, and then I love how Ron responds. Says, how many monsters do you think this place could hold? <laughs> I'm like, well, so far, Fluffy, Norbert, two trolls, the giant squid, Aragog, um, so a bunch. <laughs> Te- technically, more more than you would expect. It's yeah. a pretty big castle. It's yeah. a pretty big castle. Um, then we go back to sort of pointing the, uh, the gun potentially at uh, Percy again. Yep. Um, where where Ron makes the comparison, like Riddle does sound like Percy, and this is kind of interesting to me because I, I I think to your point about Hermione, where it's like she's saying something where it's like okay, let's take the blame off of Hagrid. Riddle probably still a good guy. The other thing that's happening with Riddle that I think is interesting inside of all this is that like Harry keeps relating to Riddle. To Riddle, yeah. You know, so like he's this like dark haired orphan boy who's kind of like sees. Hogwarts as his home. Yep. He's been celebrated as like a little bit of a hero, you know, so it's like, you know, they they're kind of one for one in a lot of different ways. Um but but then the comparison of of Riddle to Percy is sort of like, you know, okay, now we're thinking like Riddle's kind of like Percy and Percy has also been someone who's been at the center of our investigation for for most of the book. Right. If you're just going on your first pass and don't know anything else, you certainly would have to be suspecting Percy at least a little bit. Right. But then the way this is Riddle does sound like Percy. So then it's like, but if you think it's Percy, then does that mean you should think it's Riddle? I, I mean, that's a good point. Right, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then Ron's question is, Riddle does sound like Percy. You asked him to squeal on Hagrid anyway, like as if Ron's opinion is like, so a few, few people got attacked. Like, don't squeal. No one's dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Like, right. As if you haven't been trying to figure out this exact mystery all year. Right. And then Hermione is, of course, like, but someone died, Ron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, of course, oh, they, they did this last chapter where they were like, Oh yeah, a, a girl died when like Dippet's talking to Riddle and is like, a girl died, and it's like, why wouldn't you just say Myrtle died? Yes, you know, yeah, you're doing right, the right. thing where you're vague on purpose. You could have said whose name it was. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Anyway, no. The, I mean, the the I feel like the book does does the the story at large so far seems to do this all the time, where there's the hilariously bad timing of anybody showing up every time Harry's in like a compromised situation. Yeah. I think in this book, there's gonna act or in this chapter, there's an instance like where it's like should we go and talk to an adult and it's like no we should definitely not go and talk to an adult <laughs> oh, I, yeah i mean there is i mean i think it's for i highlighted at least laid it on the page when her mind is like do you think we should go ask hagrid about it all yes <laughs> yeah, like, yeah yes yeah. please go do that right it's right. like and if you in event because of course eventually they do but if they'd done it 
then then he could have told them everything exactly yeah exactly yeah no you're 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 dead right and i mean this this is like i think what must have been like the challenge in writing is just constantly needing to like like create this maze for the characters to like walk through to where it's like should we do this it's like no we ruled that out for good reason yeah <laughs> yeah you know it's four like, pages later we should definitely go talk to how do that oh yeah. it's too late now oh yeah. man yeah that is uh i mean that's so often the case it's like i wonder how often you're doing this like in real life too where it's just like oh, i know i should do that but that like might that might well it might like bother that person so i just won't so i just won't so so i just, just won't. won't it's like yeah. if someone's reading your book they're like why just go talk to them <laughs> No, I get you. I yeah. get you. I literally had this happen yesterday because yeah. I've been trying to keep seahorses for quite some time. Yeah. And I was communicating with the breeders of the seahorses. Okay. And I was like, yeah, I'm using this like super high quality like frozen shrimp food. Yeah. And they were like, oh, no, that's way too big. You should be using a smaller version. And it's like one of these things where like one of the first things I ever learned was this particular shrimp I always use is like the best shrimp for the case. Yeah. You know, it's it's like it's like the most nutritious that there is. And then it was like, yeah, but it's too big for seahorses. Sea small little snoots and I was like I never even considered using a different food other than the food that's obviously the best food so this just happened to me this week and wow. so as you were describing that I was like I have to give this example this is it. There especially it is. since it's seahorses which yeah. are so quirky and weird Ben also manages an aquarium company oh yeah for context yeah if you're, if you're <laughs> <laughs> it's like why is like, Ben wait, talking what? about seahorses yeah there's, yeah. The, there's the context uh, yeah, aquarium company so there's that there's that uh, let's see so there's uh, it's been like four months uh, four months is that what it says since the last attack I think Yes, four months. Right. Yes, since and Justin and Neely had the snack. Yeah. Everyone seems, it's like all of a sudden everyone seems to be like, I guess it's fine. It's over. Who even cares yeah. anymore? Because like uh, Ernie McMillan asked Harry quite politely to pass a, p- pass a bucket of leaping toadstools in her biology one day. And just like this, this to me doesn't add up at all because it's like what, j- like even if, even if Ernie has decided, you know what? Harry seems to have given it up. Four months later, he hasn't done anything. What a laugh! Am I right? I like know. why? Like you, as far as we know, he still thinks Harry did it. But I guess he's just like, well, if he quit, who even cares? Who can stay mad after four? Who months? Who can stay mad? He petrified my friend. Whatever. No, I think this is totally. I I kind of agree with your early assessment that like maybe petrification is like in the wizarding world not as dire as we tend like as we we would interpret or read it as. It's mm-hmm. like it's massively inconvenient. But on the other note, it is the second year herbology class that that raises mandrakes. Yeah, you know, so it's sort of like yeah, it's like you know every year we got to be doing this. Petrification's gonna be happening. We you know we raise the mandrakes. We got all of our solutions. Mm -hmm. you know it's like sometimes it's gonna happen it's wizard school you know like i I don't know if that could possibly be like in the back of the minds of people it's like it's inconvenient that it happened right and like it is bad that we don't know how it happened and it's happened like a bunch but like we'll fix it right right right. there's there's a solve not a big deal Mm -hmm. um yeah so it's like as long as it doesn't keep happening then we're all good right yeah but honestly credit to well i'll I'll get there in a minute i'll get there in a minute so we'll we'll continue yeah all right the next like uh page just basically just a whole bunch of prisoner of azkaban set up um okay. as the uh second years all have to choose their new subjects and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do um ron ron surprises me and says like we keep all our old subjects or else i'd have ditched defense against the dark arts which i guess he's assuming it'll just be lockhart again the next year the pattern hasn't really revealed itself to ron yet right yes but. yeah <laughs> yeah which you know based on the fact that like he said brothers going there for years and nobody's ever had the same dada professor for for yeah. two years straight it seems like it should be pretty evident it should be yeah um but it is crazy to me that i, I highlighted that exact same line because i was like it's so crazy for me to think that any of the golden trio would be like yeah you know defense against the dark arts who needs it it's right like, that pr- that ends up being like all of their speciality yeah you right know, that's, like, that's the big that's, one that's, that is the big one that's like the most important class yeah that they end up taking so um and hermione gets that she says no but that's very important um and then it's kind of interesting just to sort of see like the different ways in like which everybody is attempting to figure out like what to take we get kind of mention of um i think arithmancy and ancient runes yep um we get mention of divination by percy surprisingly yes when he says it depends where you want to go it's never too early to start thinking about the future so i'd recommend divination which is just like Percy is pro divination. I mean, he gets an OWL in it, so I guess he must 
either be successful and or at least understand how to take the tests or whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, I know. That's like, I mean, that's a thing is that like Trelawney is not a very good teacher. I, I don't think. I mean, I think that's safe to say. Yeah. Um, like the OWLs seem more like a standardized test that maybe yeah. aren't devised by the <clears throat> professors themselves. Yeah. So I mean, this is not. I mean, I'm sure anybody you know could could relate to a scenario where you had a not so good teacher for a course, but you like even if you didn't learn from them maybe you still like self-taught yourself yeah like from the book from the book or whatever yeah. so it's like you know my my uh chemistry teacher wasn't very good but i but i still was able to eventually understand you know the basic fundamentals of high school chemistry yeah i mean like, even like lavender and parvati like get to the point where they're like you know oh the stars are like this that means that and friends is like that's complete bananas <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it's the sort of thing that they seem confident in saying because like they've read it in the text books or so you know i'm not sure if you're you know owl is like read these tea leaves and you know percy looks at it and it's like yeah that looks like a hat that means this i memorized it out of a book yeah exactly know? exactly right. yeah it's like that's probably good enough for the test right um, right or the way he phrases the sentence is that it's like he's taking divination as a way to literally glimpse into his own future well i mean yeah, I mean, yeah if there's anybody who i think has kind of got like the the vanity maybe you know like attached to their trajectories i could see percy holding on to some of that and, yeah. and hoping to catch a glimpse of his future glory or position as minister for magic or something. Yeah, but I think the other way, the uh, the main thing this like the way in which they're all choosing different classes and stuff is just supposed to introduce you to all of what the new classes will be because they mention ancient runes and arithmancy and divination and care of magical creatures and maybe even muggle stu- yeah, and muggle studies. Right. So right, I think yes. I think that's all of them. Um, so it's, it's like a, it's a very concise way to be like, yes, here's what we can look forward to in book three. I know. Yeah. 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 So that, that's kind of fun. It's always nice to see the, see the setup, the groundwork. Yeah. It, it also, I was going to say, as we entered this week's chapter, so our last few chapters have been such heavy hitters and I was like, I could see this one being like a little bit more tame because yeah, literally like you've got the, you've got the title being Cornelius Fudge who barely shows up in the chapter at all. The image is the list, which is just not even that important of an artifact to the overall story. And we, we, we use an entire page just talking about what classes they're going to take next year right. with, with no really significant chamber of secrets plot points being discussed at all. Yeah, not really until I suppose uh, the, we get to our next page here. The next thing that happens is uh, Harry returns to the Gryffindor common room and to discovers that someone has just gone through all of his stuff and clearly been looking for something. But uh, and of course, we know that this is Ginny looking for Riddle's diary, which she finds. Yes. Um, but what is crazy to me about this is that uh, we also are told that they are the Gryffindors have been given the second years have been given something new to think about over the Easter holidays. Um, which is when they're looking at all of the class schedules for next year and whatever. Right. And when Ginny initially realized that Harry had the diary was way back on Valentine's Day. So it has taken her a good like six weeks to suddenly decide like I got to do something about this. Like time to time to act. Time to act. And it's like what like I, why doesn't this happen like on February fifteenth? Right. You know this right. should happen. They're like sh- like because Ginny what. The reason she does this is because she's afraid Harry is going to figure out how the diary works and figure out she's the one doing it. Right. Or that she's been the one responsible. And it's like, what? Like, if that's your fear, that is like happening tomorrow, not what, a minimum of six weeks later. Yes, yes. You know? Th- this is one of those things where I think like time is always very wimbly wombly yeah. when it comes to all of these books. Like, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable how any, any page you read any interaction that Harry has in class, something eventful is always happening, but it means prior to, you know, like, like really the distance between Valentine's day and where we're at right now, so little must be going like Harry must just be actually having like regular every regular like, classes days yeah. of school like they're not making any progress they're, they're not like really discussing any more about the chamber of secrets there's no other attacks like it's just been like kind of like a tame yeah stretch of, of time yeah yeah I mean it's been but it, but but a big stretch of time for Ginny to suddenly just be like well 
<laughs> that's it. Enough's enough. I'm getting up there. I'm getting up there. I'm, I'm get, doing maybe, it. Maybe she had to devise a way to do it because we do know that when the boys try to go up to the girls' dormitories, it, like the the stairs, yeah, uh, like flatten out into a slide and like a caterwauling charm. Yeah, it goes, goes off. off. Yeah. yeah, so it's like maybe maybe it's like okay, you got to find like a strategic way to get up there, like string yeah. a rope up to the top. Or no, something. but it's not the girls can go to the boys' dormitory. Oh, it's just the other way around. Because Hermione, Hermione comes up to the boys. You're yeah. right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So that's yeah, I, I was I was trying to lend some credence to a scenario that it takes longer than you'd expect in order to get up there, but can't even do that. Can't even do that. Ginny just suddenly, I guess, I guess she just finally freaks out enough to go do it because she breaks into the boys' dormitory room and steals the diary. Yes. So this is this is another one of those like kind of in the vein of like the whodunit. So like throughout the story, you know, you're you are you're you're kind of being given glimpses. You're you as a reader can be hypothesizing. You can be focusing in on the various like red herrings and, and trying to determine whether or not there's like enough meat on those bones right. to to like point an accusation at somebody. To me, what's really big about the end of this scene right here is the is the sentence that says, but only a Gryffindor could have stolen. Nobody else knows our password. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. To which I wrote, "Well, you got y- you guys personally broke into the Slytherin common room earlier this year." Oh well, there's you that. Know. There's <laughs> that. Yes, but like you know, like Harry's reaction saying exactly yeah. said Harry to me is sort of like okay. Now, if you're the reader, it's like it's a Gryffindor. Right. Like it almost has to be right a Gryffindor which even that you know it's like you're like no Gryffindors are the good guys right they how could it be they can't be the ones that like you know attacking the school that's yeah. so unlikely that means that means it's someone in our camp so it's like at that point in time it's like okay could it could it be Percy right you know it's yeah, like this like, is when you're really supposed to narrow in like it's it almost has to be who else could it be it almost has to be but but then the next thing that happens in in the chapter is we cut hard cut to Quidditch yeah you know they wake up to a, a brilliant sunshine a light refreshing breeze yeah there's like yeah they're like it has to be a gryffindor anyway quidditch <laughs> it's like wait what no wait what what happened next yeah who did they think did it <laughs> yeah like can we did you guys did you just like circle around the common room get some alibis or anything or exactly yeah. exactly yeah because it seems it seems like anybody in gryffindor common room would be like wait somebody ransacked your room like yeah that, that's important for all of us to know because we all live here right exactly you know, like everybody's gonna want to know what's up but mm-hmm. no no we're, we hard cut over to quidditch which i also think is kind of interesting because um you know it's it's you know like whatever oliver's super excited they're eating their breakfast they're going out to the quidditch pitch in the process of going out to the quidditch pitch um i believe let's see harry hears the kill this time let me rip tear yes. you know whatever and that <laughs> such false promises basilisk i know seriously rip seriously. someone to shreds why don't you i dare you I right. dare you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I you, don't believe it. You're all lies. We know all it. All talk. We know it. We all know hiss it. and no bite. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So anyway, um, Harry hears it. He lets Harry, or Ron and Hermione know. Uh, Hermione immediately has a brain blast and says, Harry, I think I've just understood something. I've got to go to the library. Yes. And then she runs away. Um, mm-hmm. And in doing so, basically, now they, they go on down to the Quidditch pitch where everybody's getting all lined up. Um, and out of nowhere, Professor McGonagall comes charging onto the field carrying an enormous purple megaphone, nice. which is like one of those scenes where I'm like, I'm like, if they did this in the movies, I probably would have critiqued it. And then somebody would have been like, no, that's canon, actually. Yeah. Giant purple right microphone. There. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, megaphone, rather, not microphone. Um, but anyway, so... Uh, this this situation I think is kind of interesting because it's like okay we've kind of narrowed in on the possibility that it almost certainly needs to be a Gryffindor but then everybody's at the Quidditch pitch for the game you yeah. know like the whole school's out there so it's like at that point in time you're like does it have to be like a member of staff right like, like who's like who's in the school? it's McGonagall she came from the school she came from it's the school. a Gryffindor she yeah. would know the password there we go she probably mm-hmm. sets the password in fact probably yeah D- did you suspect McGonagall not even one bit yeah no, no me yeah either yeah and in fact this is actually one of my favorite like there's something I really 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 love I mean I, I love McGonagall as a character in general um but there are these moments because she's so like firm and strict about everything when she does get kind of like soft yeah. and caring it's like you feel like she really means it i know it's, it's like, like it's like it's maybe the sternness is just like this is my professional i'm a teacher mode but like there are like i I've, i do care about all of you a lot i just don't like act like it you know well you know it's, yeah. it's sort of like in order to maintain 
order. You know, I need to keep this stony facade. I need to be your teacher. I'm not your friend, like whatever. But then it's like, you know, when, when push comes to shove, it's like, no, I do care about you guys a lot. And I, and I do feel for you. And I see the struggles you go through and everything. It's just, it's not my job. It's not my position to be there being that person for you. Um, But then she's being really good with, with Harry and and Ron and everything. Yeah. Um, Although let's back up a sec because something before the Quidditch match gets canceled, this, this stood out to be a such, so unusual, another just random Madam Hooch moment, which I still don't know what she even does, but the teams walked onto the field to tumultuous applause. Oliver Wood took off for a warm up flight around the goal posts. Madam Hooch released the balls and then that's the part that is baffling to me because the next sentence is the Hufflepuffs who played in Canary Yellow were standing in a huddle having a last minute discussion of tactics. So I'm like, wait, 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 wait. She released the balls before the game started? <laughs> what are, are you the, doing? Are the blooders just like, oh, like Oliver's up there doing like a warm up lap or whatever. Yeah. And he's just getting battered. He's just getting by, battered by, by bludgers. By both bludgers, yeah. which are like, we have no other targets. So this guy's up here. So, yeah. you know, I know what's not. I guess the screen. snitch is just loose already. I guess so. I mean, a part of me feels like that sort of makes sense. Like the seekers can't watch it come out of the box and immediately start following it. Like as of the game starting, it's already out there. But like, if you know that's the case, then the seeker is (laughs) like, if I was Wood, I'd be like, Harry, you need to be on the pitch like 30 minutes earlier. Just like be looking for it the whole time. Just just be looking. Just Just no, while no one's there. Okay. You got it. Cool. You you stand on the ground. Look at the sun. (laughs) Yeah. Do not lose that snitch. Yeah. Yeah. Keep an eye on it at all costs. Anyway. Okay. That's all Um, I wanted to say. I don't understand. That seems like a poor order of operations. Hooch. Hooch. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yes, anyway. It does. Yes. Um, but let's get on to McGonagall. Yeah. So we got McGonagall who basically says like, Potter, I think you better come with me. And then Ron basically is like, come like running over and is like, wait, what about me? And, and McGonagall's like, yes, perhaps you should come too, Weasley. And they get up to the hospital wing where she says, this is going to be a bit of a shock <laughs> in a surprisingly gentle voice. And it's like, oh man, she's scared. Oh, the worst. Um, and yeah, we, we discover that there has been a double attack, which maybe the double attack is what's really like stressing people out mm-hmm. so much. Um, or, or maybe everybody just cares deeply about Hermione and they're like, no, she's our best student if she's down. Well, the last double attack was on a ghost, you know. <laughs> True. Yeah, <laughs> Which is yeah. like, that's the part that seemed like it really freaked everyone out. Like, hey, hey, what can hurt a ghost? Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah. So then so then we're discovering that Hermione has been attacked uh, and Madame Pomfrey is bending over. Uh, and this is this is one of those things where there's a correction from the audiobook over to the, oh. the written copy. Um, the original copy of this story described the, um, the other person who has been attacked, who we, of course, know to be Penelope Clearwater, as a fifth year girl not a sixth year girl and i believe what's up oh sorry i'm just trying to figure out where where does it say sixth year girl oh it says madame pomfrey was bending over a sixth year girl for a long oh. with, with long curly hair okay harry recognized her as the ravenclaw they'd accidentally asked for directions to the slytherin common room okay okay great. yeah yeah and on the bed next to her was hermione but but it, now it's been so the it used to say fifth it used to say fifth now it's sixth. now it's six okay so yeah. So and I think it's because does she end up being a head girl? I can't remember uh, next year, but I think the idea here is that her and Percy are just in the same in the same year in the same year. Got yeah, it? Because next year is Percy's last year, right? So I think that yeah, otherwise she would just be like a year a year below Percy. So anyway, just Got a small it. modification, but I always find those to be incredibly interesting when I find them. Um, we this is the point where we where now that we know the whole story because we've read the story so many times. Um, Hermione is holding a small circular mirror, and this is because she has of course realized that it's a basilisk and upon realizing it's a basilisk she's peeking around corners um, which immediately pays off <laughs> which immediately pays off thank goodness and i think she has also handed one to to penelope as well do they does it say that they both had one or just hermione i think they just both used hermione's okay okay maybe that's what yeah. it is yeah okay um, but do you think the basilisk like cannot shred up the petrified people like once they're petrified they're just like oh no it's basically a rock now you know, like, I who no else idea. is even around this time? You I know? know. Yeah. It's like, it's not like there's anybody there to like chase them off or something. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like, what? Well, otherwise the basilisk is like, man, you want to know what's extremely inconvenient? I've got these eyes that can like petrify stuff and or laser burn them and or laser burn them. Yeah. yeah. We don't get to see any scorch marks on this particular scene. That's true. We don't get to look at the scene on this time. Yeah. Um, but no, it is. It is like one of those things where it's just like, man, well, oh, man. What 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 are you what are you doing there, Basilisk? What's what's your, what's your play? Or is it just meant to be like terrifying? Like, 
I guess we know eventually they're trying to lure Harry down. So maybe he's just maybe just leave him like some breadcrumbs. I don't know. I mean, I feel like he's trying to kill all of these people and failing over and over and over again. It's not working so well. Not working so well, Basilisk. Yeah. Come on, man. Uh, Shred somebody. <laughs> you say you're good. Huh? You say you're good. You're being awfully creepy to, to 10 year old us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, all the students are uh, forced back to their common rooms here. Uh, there's another great little misdirection on Percy where Percy Weasley was sitting in a chair behind Lee, but for once he didn't seem keen to make his views heard, which one is like sort of red herring. That's sort of like throwing shade at him. Uh, but then George sort of covers for him and says, that raven will go up, Penelope Clearwater, she's a prefect. I don't think he thought the monster would dare attack a prefect, which is like Percy literally said that earlier in the story. He did. So there's that. And it's like the re- but, but it's also sort of like a rare, like sweet moment from Percy where the real reason he's not talking is because he's so worried about his girlfriend. I know, but it, like this is like one of those crazy things where I'm like, why not? Why not just tell people? I know. Like you're, uh, you're right. You're right. It is a gr- another thing. It's just like, dude, Percy, it's like, I love that you love your girlfriend and stuff like that, but stop being so embarrassed about know, your yeah, relationship like, like i can i can see a world where you're home over the summer you're all living in the borough it's like you, you know the 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 parameters and status and positions and years and everything that you have at school is not here to protect you your siblings are fred and george right. they're inevitably going to give you a hard time for having a girlfriend because the high schoolers be right. like that you yeah. know i could see a world where it's like okay maybe you don't want to talk about it or like like put yourself in the position to have that conversation and this this is me attempting to go back into the mind of like a 16 year old version of myself right that could be more secretive with this information but you've been at school for almost a full year now it's like have you guys been spending the whole year sneaking around in the dungeons in the dungeons because yeah. next year we know that they're just going to be openly in a relationship i know like it's a thing like they, everybody just knows what's going on and nobody's like busting them for it yeah exactly you know? it's totally fine it's going to be fine um the other thing though just just slightly before that though is uh lee jordan is recounting all the various victims and he says there's two gryffindors uh uh, not counting a Gryffindor ghost, one Ravenclaw, one Hufflepuff. And this is sort of like, it's like earlier in the chapter, we've just decided like, well, it almost has to be a Gryffindor. But then all of a sudden it's like, well, now it's looking like the Gryffindors are dropping like flies and Slytherin's the only one who hasn't had any victims yet. Right. And so it's like, wait, so is it a Slytherin? You know, so, th- th- yeah, so again, the confusion. Right. Yeah. This, this again kind of goes back to like the whodunit model where it's just sort of like, it's like, wait, no, them? I was a page ago. I was, I was sure it had to be a Gryffindor, but now are we thinking it's not? Right. Could it be Hermione? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that boy, she's a, she attacked herself. She attacked herself. Brilliant, I say. Yes, yes, indeed. There it is. Uh, and let's see. Then they get down to the bottom of the page and they say, what are we going to do? Said Ron quietly. And Harry's here. Do you think they suspect Hagrid? And it's like, <laughs> how could they not at this <laughs> point? They should absolutely suspect Hagrid at this point. Like, if this is why he was expelled, why they broke his wand, they should a million percent be asking him questions already. Yes. You know, yes, like, I mean, they're wrong. They'd be wrong about it, but they absolutely <laughs> should suspect him. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, that, that's a, that's, that is like what it comes down to. It's sort yeah. of like if that's the last known evidence any of us have to do anything with the Chamber of Secrets and the person is still in proximity, someone needs to be talking to someone him. Someone needs to be talking to him, man. I mean, that, that's just covering your bases. That's, that's yeah. you know, simple safety. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, he goes, I, was like, I can't believe it's him this time. Last time, sure. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he was just a kid then. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so then, then they finally decide for the first time all year to bust out Harry's dad's old cloak. Oh, it is about yeah. time, boys. It, it is it, about time. I know, yeah. If, if you have an invisibility cloak and you're at wizard school and you're not using it like at least once a week, I think you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no doubt. It's, it's like no someone doubt. who has like a really nice car and they just leave it parked in their garage all the time. It's like, you got to drive it. You got to drive it, dude. Yeah, like, what's what the are point you doing? of having it? You yeah. have one of the Deathly Hallows, bro. Not that you're aware of that or anything or even what those are. Yeah. Um, it sounds like the trip underneath the invisibility cloak is uh, not so easy because there's so many ghosts and teachers and such roaming the corridors. And yet, uh, this sentence surprises me. It says, it was with relief that they reached the oak front doors and eased them open. I'm like, you have all these guards roaming all over your school and nobody's manning the front door? (laughs) Like, come on, Dumbledore. Like, what are you doing? I know. No one's on the front door. Right. It's like Dumbledore is supposedly the most brilliant wizard uh, ever. 
you know, yeah. like, like just raw intelligence and magical prowess. And it's sort of like, it's like he can figure out the Horcruxes. He can figure out and piece together all these obscure memories and details from things that happened, you know, I think at that point in time, like 70 years prior. Yeah. And, and, and here we are. And it's like, really, really, it's like, there's not a huge list of creatures capable of petrifying things that could have something to do with Salazar Slytherin. And uh, right. <laughs> if you've if you've talked to Newt ever, you know what a basilisk is. Right. Hagrid's having the rooster problem. Like yeah, these are the puzzle pieces, my friend. These are the puzzle pieces right there. Yeah. The, my only my only um allowance for this is that this is the Dumbledore's big plan situation. And he's like, Harry's he's he's on he's gonna go to. I mean, I don't know how he could. He doesn't know about the diary, so no. he'd have no way to know that Harry knew about Hagrid, right? But other, you know, may, maybe he's like, Harry's probably gonna go visit Hagrid tonight. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he seems to know that he's there later. He does seem to know that he's yeah. there later, which that was something. So yeah, we can we can zoom forward. I think a little bit here because basically uh, Harry and Ron are underneath the cloak. They make their way down to Hagrid, who's clearly like realized that at this point in the equation, too much time has passed. Yeah, and he he feels fairly certain that somebody's coming for him and. He's correct. And he's prepared to shoot them with a crossbow. With a crossbow. I know. <laughs> he says he's leveling the crossbow at them as they open the door. I'm like, who would he have fired it at had it been them? Yeah, Lucius you know? shows up first. Lucius yeah. dies. Absolutely. <laughs> you know what? Yes. If Lucius shows up first, he has got a crossbow bolt in the chest. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, that, that's a good point, though, where it's sort of like, it's like, Hagrid, I, I appreciate the fact that you're like on edge, but like, that's a full blown weapon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you think shooting someone with the crossbow is going to get you off the hook, it, it is. It's it not going to help. It's not going to help. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So then, so then, basically, very, very shortly after they arrive, um, they are served uh, cups of boiling water because Hagrid forgot to add the tea bags. Uh, there's fruit cake on the plate, uh, which I, it, this is always one of those things where I sort of love the fact that Hagrid always does have baked goods. He's making he's baking food down yeah, there, man. It's just like if he's if he's not tinkering or meddling with creatures, he's meddling with his favorite new recipes. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's kind of fun to imagine. Yes. That. Um, but yeah, then Dumbledore walks in. He's looking deadly serious. This kind of similar to the McGonagall thing. This feels like a, kind of like a juxtaposition. It's like yeah. normally you know. Uh, McGonagall's very stern and she was very soft in this chapter and normally Dumbledore is very like whimsical and upbeat and fun and positive and he's looking very intense yeah you know uh, which we know he can look he, like, yeah this, this happens uh, more times going throughout the future so I think it's it's good usage when it's there uh, because it, it gets the point across very very effectively um Let's see here. And then with Dumbledore, though, also comes in Cornelius Fudge, um, who, who, I mean, not, I, I'm not really going to defend Fudge or anything, but at least to his credit, he doesn't really seem happy about the fact that he's there. He does not. Yeah. He's, like we said earlier, he's like mostly just like we've got ministry. We've got to, we've got to be seen to be doing something. And it's like, yeah, but like you are doing something and what feels like the obvious thing to do. So like, I don't know, just own it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but then he even he's like so wishy-washy about it. He says, "Not a punishment, Hagrid. More a precaution. If someone else is caught, you'll be let out with a full apology." And it's like to me, it's also crazy that if it's not a punishment and it is just a precaution, that like maybe you don't need to go all the way to Azkaban. I know. With it. Ju like, just just take Hagrid from the school. Go put him in like a holding container right. at the ministry. Right. Surely like, that exists. Surely that exists. Surely you have any other holding facility between like w like people who have committed crimes and people who are sentenced for life. Like. All crimes end in Azkaban in the wizarding world. Right, right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, but so Azkaban also feels like, yet again, inside of this chapter, another small setup for for the next book installment. Absolutely. As long as, as long as we're keeping track of those things. Uh, then then Hagrid gets yet another visitor. It's a very, it's a very <sighs> happening hut on this particular evening uh. um, where Lucius finally shows up. And, and this is like one of those scenes, again, like where it's like, I think a lot of times we have turned Lucius into such a joke 
of a character and and on on like the broad strokes version of him he's pretty ineffective at almost everything yeah um and, and we've made fun of lucius kind of relentlessly to be honest with you so he's sort of similar to like lockhart where it's like it's really funny to think about lockhart as a character but when you hear him talk you're like you are so frustrating. Right. Like it is driving me nuts to imagine somebody behaving in the way that you behave. But then you've got Lucius who shows up and man, he is, he is just a jerk. He absolutely like, is. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's making fun of Hagrid's house. He's being very like, I don't know, smug, very smug. I mean, he, cause he's basically there and he's just like, well, 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 I've got a brand new toy here and I'm going to go play with it. And I get to take Dumbledore away from the school and you can't stop me, Cornelius. This is something only the governors can do. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. yeah, basically. Excellent evil laugh. Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so basically he says, uh, I think that he's, he's also, um, let's see here. Uh, he, he says, I simply called at the school and was told that the headmaster was here. And what exactly did you want with me, Lucius, said Dumbledore. He spoke politely, but the fire was still blazing in his blue eyes. So I kind of want to like dial in on that because it's the second time it's out of this chapter that Dumbledore's eyes sort of have this like fiery yeah. nature to them, mm-hmm. which is not even the last time that we'll see this happen in the series altogether. Like Dumbledore is associated with fire on numerous occasions, which this is kind of like one of our like fun fan theories is that like Dumbledore as an animagus could be a Phoenix. A Phoenix. Yeah. Um, Cause he's obviously like very highly like aligned with them. And then like, even like the, uh, huge displays of magic that we see from him, like in the cave, for instance, like when you know he's fending off like, yeah. the Inferi, he's creating Big like fire. a massive inferno. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's also like very strong. I think after um, after Harry arrives back in Goblet of Fire, Dumbledore like lifts him with like a surprising amount of like strength. Yeah, which like phoenixes also have. Phoenixes also have. Um, what was the other? No one? healing tears that I'm aware of. No healing tears. Oh, he likes music. He does like he music. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he says like the mu- like music, uh, magic beyond anything we do within these walls. Yeah, and yeah, then, and like, like Phoenix the Phoenix song. lament or whatever, like lift your spirits. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so he does. He, he and then of course you know yeah he he has a, uh, a Phoenix himself. He has a Phoenix, and there's that like line in Fantastic Beasts where. It's like a phoenix will appear to a Dumbledore in need or whatever. Right. So we know yeah. that they're highly aligned. And, and and I think also in Fantastic Beasts, he says a line like, I've always had an affinity for uh, the legendary birds the legendary, or whatever. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's yeah, like, yeah it sounds like Pokemon. The, the, the Pokemonification <laughs> yeah. of it. But you get one of which is a Moltres. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which right. is a phoenix which and is the ho o, my guess. And right. Both there. But the other thing that I think is interesting about this that, that I wanted to draw attention to his eyes on is, uh, and this was literally just as I was reading this chapter, because basically this is a, a situation where Hagrid knows that Ron and Harry are inside of the cabin, but it also definitely seems like Dumbledore knows that they're inside. It the definitely cabin. seems like it. And we get two references to his eyes, which is sort of like what drew my attention there in the first place. But it, it brought me back to Mad-Eye Moody and his ability to see through Harry's cloak when he's yeah. like trapped inside of the trick stair in Goblet of Fire in the middle of the night with the egg. And I was like, okay, it's kind of fascinating because Mad-Eye's uh, I, the one that can like do all these powers, is described as being like electric blue. Yeah. And Dumbledore is described as having like piercing blue, blue eyes. eyes. Yeah. And I'm like, is there a world where Dumbledore's both of his eyes are like the equivalent of like mad eyes? Yeah, where eye? he's just like, yeah, it's like when he says it's like piercing blue eyes, he's like, he can literally look through you if he wants to. Yes. I mean, and like there are there are so many occasions where Dumbledore's vision is described as like like as if he like Harry's being x rayed. Yeah. You know, so it's like it, I'm kinda like that's sort of wild. Right. You know, like is it possible that Dumbledore made Mad Eye Moody's eye? Oh yeah, I mean doesn't seem impossible because well, we see them in Dumbledore's memories in the pensive where he talk. I mean, he's already friends with Moody before he has the eye pre-electric. Eye. Yeah. 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 So it's like, okay, 
Okay. Ele- ele- electric blue. I don't think the eye itself is like motorized. Yeah, no, yeah. I don't think there's yeah. a, no muggle technology in there. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, but anyway, I was like, okay, that's that's kind of interesting. I've never really considered that before. I've always assumed, you know, that Dumbledore, like, you know, he's got like a super sensory, uh, even just being like a legilimens, it almost sometimes feels like that could be like a, a way to be like, I'm going to read the memory or I'm going to read the minds of the people in the room. And it's like in doing so, it's like if you hear Harry's thoughts, it's like, I know Harry's in the room. Like to me, that's always been like a way right. that, that he could have like discovered. Yeah, that they're there. That they're there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but there's like that. It, there is like it does like a like he, he sees them or something because it says for a second Harry was almost sure Dumbledore's eyes flickered toward the corner where he and Ron stood hidden. Yes. Yeah. So mm-hmm. so it does. I mean, it seems like it, I mean, if, if nothing else, he knows where they are. He knows that they are there and where they are. And like clearly the message you will find that I will only truly have left the school when none here are loyal to me. You will also find that help will always be given at Hogwarts to those who ask for it is clearly directed at Harry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So so both Hagrid and Dumbledore just openly having discussions with the unknown people yeah. in the room. <laughs> and much to like his <laughs> Malfoy just like admirable sentiments. Okay. Thank you for randomly announcing that. Yes. We yeah. shall all miss your highly individual way of running things. Bye bye. Right, right, yes. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> um but of course Dumbledore's line there, like the the having uh you will find that I've only truly left the school when none here are loyal to me. Um this is definitely like one of those like it's a it's a definite setup for the Chamber of Secrets coming soon where Harry is in the chamber beneath the school. And I think Tom Riddle like says Dumbledore has been forced from the school by the mere memory of me. Yeah. And it's like, and then like Harry comes back and he's like Dumbledore. Yeah. (laughs) Like he's here. As long as people are loyal to him, which I am, which I am. Fox. (laughs) Chills. Oh man. Amazing. So cool. So cool. Or or, is it Fox or is it just Dumbledore himself? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's Fox. Fun. It's Fox. Yeah, it's Fox. Um, but yeah. So anyway, uh, that that pretty much. Yeah. Then then of course we round off with Hagrid speaking also to the room, and we get the mention of someone will need to feed Fang for me, and also uh, that uh, you would follow the spiders if if anybody needed to find out some stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Fudge yeah. stared at him with amazement. <laughs> I highlighted the number. Reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's like one of those situations where it's like, if you don't know what else is going on, you're like, what? What? <laughs> what are you talking about spiders <laughs> for, dude? It's, it's like, especially, especially because in these exact, in this exact situation, the reason that the Minister for Magic is there in the first place is because Hagrid had been known to be keeping a very dangerous ca- uh, spider inside of the castle right and there is Hagrid saying to seemingly no one right follow the spiders right it's almost like like if you're the minister in this moment if you're fudge you're like yeah we got the right guy yeah for sure it's like yeah it's fo- definitely him right, right 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 yeah like you know it's like follow follow the spiders that's what you're going with in this plea for innocence yeah because <laughs> yeah, you're apparently talking to me <laughs> right yeah. right if i didn't want to know anything fudge uh, yeah if it was uh, me i'd follow the spiders we know yeah that's what you would do yeah sounds like maybe you are following some spider orders you yeah, know yeah yeah maybe maybe so maybe so <laughs> yeah um also there's a line down here i think it's from uh i don't actually know who's saying ron i think it says there'll be an attack a day with him gone talking about dumbledore not being there which i'm just like do you what do you think dumbledore is doing to prevent the other attacks True. You know? <laughs> true. True. Yeah. That's the thing. Is like he, secretly in the night, Dumbledore's having mad duels <laughs> with the basilisk. With, with the ba- he's winning most. He's of win- the time. most of the time. He's yeah. getting. Yeah. He's like he is thwarting that guy off. Woo. Yeah. He's doing it. He's Got doing him. It. So anyway, there, there's chapter 14. I feel like it's, I mean, it's a little bit of like a setup chapter. I think it's, you know, kind of giving us some exposition, some some like overall uh, big plot points and, and that type of thing. But it, 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 I don't know if I want to call it like a fluff chapter, but it's it's sort of interesting. It hops around a little bit. It, not everything is... Yeah, I mean Absolutely it's not it's not the very it. secret diary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but exactly. then the next one is Aragog, so it, yes. things are going to ramp right back up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're 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 about to. We've had like the the very small like you know the the plot has been building and building and building. We had a small like little plateau there, and we're about to like rock it right off. Into yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. The, we're the, we're in the middle of the rising action. You the, know, the finale. Yeah, as it were. So, um, anyway, yeah, that closes out chapter fourteen. There we go. Well, I've got a review for us here. Lay it on me from Blind Guy ninety three. Okay. 
Hey. Says, hey, brothers. Been following you both for years. Absolutely love the podcast. I have a question. It seems extraordinarily unlikely that Snape would have hap- has- would ever haphazardly leave his potion book around. I don't think he wanted Harry to find it, but do you think there was some part of him that wanted another talented, underprivileged Slytherin to find it? Also, I truly believe Snape was great at occlumency because of the deep, albeit troubling, love he had for Lily. Voldemort would never be able to pass through that type of love. Ooh. Which I liked this idea that the real reason Snape is good at occlumency is because he has one secret that he absolutely doesn't want anyone to know, like basically his whole life. Yeah. And that it's that he's in love with Lily Evans. Yes. And he even even when he like even when he makes the deal with Dumbledore, he says, No one must ever know. Right. And it's like, that's his condition. And he's like, the one good thing about you, okay. <laughs> it's but it's like, like Snape has been keeping this secret for so long. He's like, I will literally, I will never ever let anyone find this out about me. Right. Like the, I will I'm gonna have to be good at occlumency, so it can't even be read out of my brain. I know. I that's that's even like I I mean, so it's interesting, like that that would be his compulsion would be like, I don't want anybody to read my mind and discover this piece of information because as you were saying it, I, I think that maybe that is, that is how this reviewer uh, meant the question. But as, as I was hearing it, I was like, Oh, is it almost as if like Snape is protected because like the primary fundamental reason for his like secrecy towards anything is love, which is like a vault that Voldemort could never that could like, maybe he's not good at occlumency. He just like, because he's so motivated by love, he is protected. Yes, his motivations are all love. And so it's like, it's almost like an encrypted code that Voldemort can't even like, he can't even see, let alone break into because right. he's so incapable of it. So it's like, he is unable, I mean, we know this to be true. Like, he is so unable to believe that Snape would be acting so on behalf of love that he would betray Voldemort at all, which is his fatal flaw, basically. Ugh, I do like that. I like this idea. Either I like I like both versions of it, where either the reason he's mastered occlumency is to hide the fact that he's in love with Lily, or the idea that because he's so in love with her, that it is, and that's his like core motivation for everything that he is protected from like probing and stuff. But well, even this would fit well though, like on the on the love notion with it would fit well because I think Dumbledore could read Snape's mind. He could know. He could, like, because Dumbledore understands love. Right. So he could potentially read Snape's mind more effectively than Voldemort ever could, but that is, like, the edge that Dumbledore has over Voldemort in the end. Right. Like, Voldemort can't crack through, so he can never know the underlying motivations, whereas Dumbledore can crack through, and therefore he can have ironclad trust in Snape, and it's like, it's not just well, faith. D- but Dumbledore it's, doesn't have to read it. Snape just tells him. No, I know, I yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, but like, at some point in time, it's like one of those questions where it's like, both Voldemort and Dumbledore are absolutely certain that they can trust Snape. Yeah. And it's like one of them is going to have to be wrong. Yes. And they're both certain that it's not them. Right. You know, but it's like, th- is it the case that like Dumbledore has like, like it's, it's ignorance on the part of Voldemort that makes him unable to figure it out where it's knowledge on the part of Dumbledore that allows that faith to, to remain. Right. I, which I prefer. Yeah. You know, cause then it's sort of like, ha Voldemort foiling your own plans yet again as usual as usual it's surprising because Voldemort like must know that he can't probe Snape's mind you know well uh, unless that's what I mean like unless it's so encrypted inside of Snape's mind that it's like he he is seeing inside of Snape's mind he can see the things that aren't protected by love I see so he can see everything else right but that would mean that would mean that he thinks he's in a room and he's seeing a ca- kind of like Hagrid's hut. It's like he he thinks he's seeing the room for what it is, but he doesn't know what's being hidden from him. Right. He can't see Harry and Ron. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, as for the copy of Advanced Potion Making, I too have found it to be unusual that this is something that Snape would part with. Yes. Yeah. I like. It seems weird that he would forget it down there yeah so i mean i I would have to go back and revisit our notes from dumbledore's big plan but it would shock me if we didn't think it was somehow relevant i know but even then it's like it's a it's really just a coin flip among whether or not harry or ron gets the book i know but i feel like if ron gets the book he's just annoyed like i think it it takes like here i think that's like harry's cunning 
bleeding through just ever so slightly. Yeah. You know, that he's like willing to be like, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. <laughs> abso- I mean, absolutely. Know? But like if he didn't get if Ron had gotten the book, he would like Harry wouldn't have been reading it. No, no, time. he wouldn't yeah. have. Yeah, no, of yeah. course, yeah. So I don't think Rom would have been at like a distinct advantage if he had it. I think no, it's yeah. only it's only at an advantage in Harry's hands. Yes. Um. So I mean, maybe, but maybe that's the coin flip. It's just like worth taking the chance on, right? You know. But I'm trying to think: is there anything really, really, really major that he learns from the half blood? I mean, he learns a lot from the half blood prince. Well, the major thing that happens is that he wins the Felix Felicis. That's the and thing. that's how he gets the secret from Slughorn. Okay. Yeah. So. All of those things feel like they could be relevant in that capacity. Then, because it's conceivable that the Felix Felicis contest could have been like a known tradition of Slughorns on day one. It definitely you feels know? like it. Yeah, like yeah. that. That could have been in there. So Dumbledore could have maybe wanted this, and he like. There, there's a world where Dumbledore like knows Harry wasn't going to take potions, but now will be allowed to take potions, and he'll discover that on day one. And like, that all plays into it in my that, mind. Actually, you know what? Because Ron, eh, here's here's the kicker. Ron wasn't going to take potions. McGonagall almost messes it up for him. Oh, you're right. McGonagall's right. like Weasley, go with him. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> you look yeah. too happy. You're doing it too. Yeah. Like, oh man. Y- you're ah. Yeah. That throws the wrench. Because uh, no, th- what I was gonna say even more than that too, though, is that we always replace the defense against the dark arts teacher, and Harry even thinks he's recruiting Slughorn for defense against the dark yeah. arts. But like the fact that that Dumbledore is looking for someone for potions so that Snape can move to defense against the dark arts would even allow for like such a situation to exist because I can't imagine Harry would e- also get away with having Snape's own copy of the book in a classroom of like eight people. Yeah. Which, which but he wasn't even going to he couldn't have taken like Harry's grades weren't good enough to have allowed him to take the uh, the NEWT level yeah. anyway. So he had to find a way to get Snape out of potions. Otherwise, Harry couldn't have taken it. Right. You know? Mm. So I don't know, a lot of it fits together. A lot of it does like, fit together yeah. in a way that, like, Dumbledore could be like, leave your potions book there, man. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So because, I mean, then, then he can win the Felix, which then the Felix is... I mean, and he... Not only does he win the Felix from Slughorn, he uses the Felix... On Slughorn. Yeah. You know? Yes. So, yeah, it all... It all well, that's the other together. reason you want Slughorn is because he knows Slughorn has this memory. Like, exactly. Dumbledore's already cooking on this. Right, right, right. Yeah. But maybe he just knows, like, Slughorn's the perfect person to pick. It's like, it's yeah. gonna... It's, it, this is like killing, like, four birds with one stone. It is. It is. Yeah. All right. I... You know what? The, the realization that Ron wasn't going to be there and the fact that it's a coin flip is only a coin flip by accident... Yeah. ...really makes it seem more intentional that the book was left there... Um, on Dumbledore's instructions. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I could see that. I could see that. It all works out so perfectly. It does all work out so nicely. It's like it comes together in such a remarkable way. Yeah. Because, of course, he's not going to have his book. That's the other thing. Right. He's, he's not going to have it. Because he doesn't and, know. And Dumbledore knows he won't have it. Right. Because he knows Snape. He knows Harry thinks he's not taking it. Right. Yeah. But he knows Harry wants to be an Auror, and he knows he's going to be allowed to take it once Slughorn's the professor. Yeah. No, it fits. Yeah. It fits too well. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So great Snape, question. Great question. Snape's not being haphazard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, it's absolutely it's a plan this is a plan yeah, yeah there we go we got there. snape and dumbledore are already cooking so many other things together in this book so i know i know yeah, yeah. it's it's a big snape book yeah for sure for yeah. sure okay great question great question man yeah. i i have to say please leave your reviews and please add your questions yes. because please, it's like, please please i feel like one of my favorite parts of each of these episodes is getting to the end and somebody asking such an insightful question Dude, i'm so impressed by the questions people leave yes. in the reviews because i mean people ask us questions about harry potter all the time and almost never are we getting anything like like new or juicy out of those questions but almost every review question is like i know like, it's like it's like wait like wait, wait <laughs> great question <laughs> So keep them coming. Well done. Thank you for your reviews. We really appreciate it. It does help the podcast. Um, I know we haven't talked about the chartables any uh, here recently, but last time I checked, we were in the we were presently in the top ten for the, the U.S., Canada, and Great Britain. No for way. Enter- entertainment news. You know that's amazing. <laughs> but that's still, amazing. there. And we're, we of course also uh, in, in an area where we're having less progress, but almost in a fun way is our our goal for one hundred thousand subscribers. Oh, we're getting there. Man. We're almost to thirty thousand. I know we're, we're we're inching our way up. It's yeah. happening slowly. 
slowly but surely, if you're one of those people that's like, oh, but my one won't contribute to the whole. It's like, it will. It will. It will, it and totally it does. Will. Yes, yes, indeed. So, be you know, if, if, if you're listening, if you're watching on YouTube, definitely slap that subscribe button. If you're listening in your car or, you know, somewhere, and you're like, all right, all right, you know what? They got me today. I'm doing it. Doing it. I'm doing it. Doing That's it. it. I'm signing up. Do it. <laughs> We'd appreciate it. It'd be so much fun to get that. Uh, you get a silver play button in 100000 You do, yeah. Anyway, that's that's our very selfish reason for asking you to do so. So we appreciate it. We'll that. put it on the set. There you go. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. All right. But otherwise, guys, thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure you turn in next week for Chapter 15, Aragog, here on Through the Griffin Door. Today's episode was edited by Ethan Edgehill. Vaishan Brandon does our art. Catherine Stein is our production manager, and the show is hosted by me and Jonathan Carlin.